Hello, I'm Paul Hare from the Center for the National Interest, and we're delighted that you're all joining us for this session today uh, on Japan. This will be the first of two sessions that uh, we're putting together as part of a project that the Center has undertaken to look at the status of and the prospects for the U.S.-Japan alliance on the 60th anniversary of the alliance, of, of the alliance and the advent of the Biden administration. Uh, the Biden team has made it clear that it uh, intends to uh, focus on in reinvigorating our alliances, and Japan will certainly be a central part of that, being one of our closest and most important allies uh, for quite a long time. Uh, but it's actually because the alliance has been so central and such a constant in U.S. Uh, policy in East Asia for so many years that we sometimes are at risk of taking it for granted. And the fact is that the, the ground has been shifting under the alliance for at least the last decade and probably more. Uh, because of the so-called rise of China and the simultaneous perception at least of the relative decline of the United States, uh, or at least of the US attention to developments in East Asia. Uh, and it seems that uh, these two trends have, have affected Japan's perception of where it fits between the two, between the United States and China, uh, which raises questions about uh, how Japan is uh, adjusting to or thinking about the, the new regional uh, balance of power and regional security dynamic. So we have framed two separate sessions uh, to explore these topics. The first one today, uh, we'll look at where the alliance fits into both sides' understanding of U.S. interest in East Asia uh, and how Japan's views in America, of American power and influence in the region uh, fit into Tokyo's assessment of the regional security environment. Uh, are there perhaps fault lines between the two countries that need to be uh, recognized and addressed? We will follow up this session uh, on Friday, uh, the 12th of February, with a second seminar that will focus on where we go next in terms of ensuring that the Alliance continues to serve its purposes and to promote the interest of both countries. And we certainly hope that you're all, uh, everyone watching today will be interested in uh, joining us for that session as well. But for today's session, we have, uh, we're very delighted to say we have a delighted, uh, we, <laughs> we have uh, three very distinguished scholars with deep ex and broad expertise in U.S.-Japan relations to, uh, to address some of the first questions that we want to address today. The, uh, and they are Professor Mike Mochizuki from George Washington University, uh, Professor Yoshihiro Soya from Keio University, uh, who we're grateful is joining us from Tokyo, uh, and Dr. Michael Auslin uh, from Stanford University. Uh, for the more extensive biographies, I'm gonna refer you to the invitation to today's event because for me to cite all of their collective accomplishments would take all the time we have for the seminar today. Uh, and I think we're eager to get into our discussion. I'm gonna ask each of the three panelists in the order in which I gave their names uh, to each start with five to seven minutes of opening remarks addressing the topic as we framed it for them. And then I will moderate a discussion uh, between and among them uh, interjecting a few questions of my own perhaps, but then finally uh, getting to the questions of you and our viewing audience. Uh, and to that purpose, I very much encourage you to uh, submit your questions uh, online in the, uh, with the Q&A function that's at the bottom of the Zoom page here. Uh, without further ado, and not to waste any more time, I think we'll get started. So I'm gonna turn first to uh, Mike Mochizuki for his comments. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's uh, great to... Uh be able to participate in this uh, panel. Uh, since this program was framed around the issue of convergence and divergence uh, between the United States and Japan, uh, maybe I should just start by saying that, uh, you know, there has been uh, an overall convergence between the United States and Japan on general interests, uh, values, strategic objectives. Uh, both countries uh, support uh, the U.S. alliance system uh, both countries are for uh, a continuation of U.S. military and economic engagement in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, both uh, support uh, the free trade system and support the promotion of uh, international economic uh, liberalization. Uh, and, and both want an international environment uh, that is congenial uh, for uh, democracies and that will facilitate uh, democratization and the protection of basic human rights uh, in the region. I think they also uh, support uh, the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and uh, they support uh, the peaceful rise of China. So there's a lot of convergence uh, between the United States and uh, Japan. 
But I would also quickly say that there are notable divergences uh, between the United States and Japan uh, because uh, they differ somewhat in their priorities uh, and they differ regarding uh, the means of promoting uh, these uh, general interests values and strategic uh, objectives. Now, Paul, you pose the issue about U.S. Uh, primacy. And you know, my view on this is all things being equal, uh, Japan would prefer uh, U.S. primacy in the Western Pacific uh, for the obvious reason uh, that Japan, more than any other country, uh, benefited from U.S. primacy uh, after World War II. Uh, Japan gained enormously on the economic front. Uh, Japan insulated itself from the negative effects of U.S. military intervention around the globe. And uh, because of U.S. primacy, uh, Japan was able to minimize its own financial and human costs of uh, maintaining its own security, but also maintaining uh, regional uh, security. So therefore, you know, Japan would probably prefer a continuation of U.S. primacy. Uh, but I think the Japanese are realistic to recognize that the days of unchallenged U.S. primacy in the region uh, are over, uh, primarily because of China's relative uh, rise. And therefore, although Japan may prefer U.S. primacy, uh, many Japanese are reluctant uh, to push for a restoration of U.S. military primacy if, and these are two very important ifs, uh, if it means an intensification of U.S.-China military rivalry that would endanger peace and stability and force Japan uh, to choose uh, between the United States and China. And the second if is if it means that Japan would be asked by the United States to assume a much greater defense burden and defense role that goes beyond the domestic constraints on security uh, policy. Now, regarding the China issue, I think Japan now faces a fundamental strategic conundrum, which I think consists of four parts. Uh, first, the Japan indeed uh, fears the rise of uh, China. And therefore, there is a significant kind of domestic political force for increasing Japan's defense expenditures and capabilities, for tightening the alliance with the United States, and encouraging the United States to revitalize its military presence in the region to counter China. But I believe that the sphere of China is not quite acute and pervasive enough to relax dramatically the domestic political constraints on defense policy. Uh, to fully embrace the notion of collective defense and to allow a major upgrade in U.S. military deployments on Japanese territory. And despite uh, the fear of China and the negative views that exist in Japan about the Chinese regime, uh, many Japanese prefer and seek a stable and peaceful relationship with China uh, because Japan's economic future remains tied to China and because they want to avoid a costly uh, an arms race with China and, uh, and a dangerous military conflict. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the accumulated effects of the China threat narrative over the last two decades, uh, Japanese leaders are now severely constrained politically uh, to fashion and pursue an effective policy of stabilizing relations with China. And so, uh, you know, there are some differences on economics Taiwan and human rights on the economic side. I believe the Japanese uh, do indeed have an interest in diversifying their supply chains beyond China, uh, but they do not favor the kind of economic decoupling that many anti-China hawks in the United States advocate. Uh, on Taiwan, uh, Japan has its own uh, version of a one China uh, policy. Uh, they recognize the PRC as the sole legal government of China. Uh, but uh, Japan, I think, c continues to want to uh, pursue a policy of strategic uh, ambiguity uh, about whether or not Japan would be involved in a Taiwan contingency. And so I think what the Japanese would do is to focus on the defense of their own islands, especially the Southwest Island chain, 
that could be helpful in a Taiwan contingency. Uh, and then on human rights, uh, the Japanese are of course very critical of what's happening uh, in Xinjiang or Hong Kong. Uh, and so they're willing to criticize China to a certain extent, uh, but I think they are much more reluctant than the United States uh, to take concrete measures. And then there are divergences in other areas. I think on Russia policy, uh, the Japanese uh, um, are very much interested in improving the relationship with Russia uh, to prevent uh, what they see as the the work uh, on the emergence of a China a Russia entente against the West. On Myanmar, I believe this poses a very uh, difficult case uh, uh, for Japan. Uh, uh, we'll see uh, how much actual substance there is uh, to the Japanese concept of a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. I could go on about uh, Korea relations, which are very important and problematic, uh, but I will leave that uh, to my friend, uh, Professor Soya, to uh, address. Thank you. Okay, should I? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Soya. Uh, yes, yeah. You next. Okay, thank, thank you very much for involving, involving me here. Uh, I, well, Mike uh, left uh, the, the issue of uh, South Korea, Japan uh, to me, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe I'll make a just quick reference to that issue toward the end of my, my initial presentation. Well, uh, <clears throat> please allow me to start with somewhat scholarly depiction of uh, the situation. Uh, I think there are uh, three dimensions. Uh, this is a sort of textbook depiction of uh, international relations. I mean, three dimensions associated with the rise of China. Uh, one, one dimension has to do with uh, power, of, and the second, second, secondly, interests, and the third is value. And, uh, and another sort of uh, you know, textbook argument is uh, there is a structure of sort of a trilemma across the three dimensions, uh, or dilemma between the two of them. And uh, in, in case of China, uh, you know, in terms of power and interest, uh, uh, for instance, military expenditure and the sort of economic uh, aspect of the rise of China, uh, the Chinese military expenditures and uh, uh, GNP, uh, economic power index, is greater than the sum of all the other Indo-Pacific uh, nations uh, now, including uh, Japan and India. So, so from, from the Chinese perspective, uh, I would think uh, it's almost a sort of common sense uh, for them that Asia now is being restructured uh, with China at the center of an order, somewhat reminiscent of uh, Sino-centricism. And uh, the fundamental source of Chinese influence uh, is, uh, has to do with uh, both economic and military uh, power. And uh, I think that's, that's a challenge that we are all facing. And uh, this, this structure means that for us, uh, Japan, of course, included, uh, without the United States involvement in terms of this power balance, uh, power structure is, is, is one-sided, uh, you know, tipped toward, toward China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore, uh, I think my way of interpreting, you know, the very general way uh, of Chinese uh, assertiveness is uh, backed by their belief that the time has come for China to come back to the center of an Asian order. If not the global order yet, I don't know how this will evolve into the future. So, so uh, I think this would uh, you know, require, uh, from our point of view, uh, continued American presence uh, in the region, uh, whether the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific. And uh, Japan is, of course, sustaining American, you know, presence in the region, uh, you know, you know, almost uh, single-handedly, if not, if not entirely, of course. And uh, and when it comes to you know the the, the some, some of the specific specific issues, uh, 
in terms of uh, power dimension, of course, alliance, with, uh, military alliance between Japan and the United States is the key. But uh, in terms of American primacy, which uh, Mike mentioned, uh, I think this is a general observation, uh, if not only Japanese uh, perspective, that American primacy is being eroded by the increasing power of China. And so as a result of that, what's happening is, uh, for instance, Japan is reaching out to other Indo-Pacific nations or the even uh, European nations to, to, to form some sort of, you know, uh, if, if not in formal rigid institution or grouping, but uh, some, some networks. And uh, I think this is in a way a natural development. And uh, the intention here is to, to sort of, uh, you know, fill the gap, you know, uh, coming from the erosion of uh, American power. So I think it is becoming all the more important for the United States to, th to begin to think of its regional presence, not only uh, with respect to the US-Japan alliance, but uh, in a way, some are diversifying American networks or presence you know, across the region. I think uh, uh, this, this is a sort of a natural development, which is uh, in a way happening consciously or unconsciously uh, as a result of the dominant position that China is increasingly occupying uh, in the region. So this is a huge and a long-term uh, truly strategic challenge. And the one diversion between Japan and the United States, uh, there could be of course issues in terms of military dimension, but uh, as to the economic dimension, uh, Japan has been since explicitly since 19, uh, 2018, when uh, former Prime Minister Abe visited China and met with uh, Xi Jinping, uh, Japan is trying to sort of strike a balance between sort of uh, military sort of deterrence on the one hand and managing economic sort of interdependence uh, with China. And this, I think this is what one of the serious sort of uh, e uh, expression of a dilemma between power and interests. And, uh, and so US sort of decoupling strategy uh, is, is somewhat to be frank, is somewhat troublesome uh, from Japanese point of view. And, uh, and, and uh, for instance, uh, US talks about its engage, economic engagement in the region and the world in the name of American interests, uh, of course, which is in a way natural, but uh, for the sake of sort of regional interest, uh, this could be detrimental to, to the prosperity of the region uh, at the time of this uh, you know, increasing influence of China. And so uh, TPP issue could be one sort of symbolic uh, you know, and a concrete uh, sort of uh, area uh, uh, to talk about this sort of divergence. And uh, so decoupling would virtually mean de-association of American presence from, from, from the China-centered process and which would inevitably mean that China uh, the temptation, you know, to, to take advantage of this. And I think this is a background against which uh, Xi Jinping talked about a possibility of China, you know, beginning to think about joining uh, TPP-11. And uh, so, so this, this, you know, contest in this, you know, uh, you know economic dimension, uh, uh, there is some worry uh, as to even President Biden talked about you know, um, um, American interest uh, at the center of its uh, engagement policy, economic policy to other region. And the value issue, uh, I think uh, Japan is, uh, as Mike uh, implied, uh, somewhat reluctant to get along with uh, the United States. And even in the Myanmar uh, development, uh, the, this has is, is gonna become uh, an issue between Japan and the United States. And uh, and the, in explaining, maybe maybe that in details, I will I will leave them to to the following kind of discussion period. But but then the so South Korea Japan uh, relationship is uh, very troublesome uh, from this uh, point of view of a bigger picture. Uh, you know, kind of regional association uh, among nations. I think is 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 very critical as I implied at the outset, and the South Korea not joining this is is uh, is, is a big problem, uh, given South Korean 
you know, uh, presence and the power and the influence. And, uh, and so, so leaving the current state of Japan-South Korea relations as is, is a huge loss, not only for South Korea and Japan, but for the entire region. And of course, uh, for the United States. So I will, I will finish here. Yeah. Yoshi, thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn now to Misha Auslan for his opening remarks. Well, Paul, thank you. Uh, it's always great to be back uh, with the center uh, to do an event. And as usual, the uh, participants on, on, on the, the call are as, you know, as knowledgeable, if not more so than all of us on the panel. So it's really a discussion among peers as opposed to us trying to tell anyone anything they don't, they don't really know. Um, Mike and, and Yoshi have already gone over extremely well that, you know, the, the, the big view, the structural view, uh, the, the sort of theoretical concepts. And so um, maybe what I can do is add, uh, I'll, I'll come in as the color man, so to speak, and talk a little bit about um, what's been going on uh, lately uh, once, you know, we've had um, the, the lay down that both Mike and Yoshi gave uh, of enduring interests of structural uh, constraints and, and uh, areas of both um, cooperation and, and potential conflict. Um, I would say first, and you know, what's, what's a good event without being a little controversial, uh, I would say first that compared to a lot of uh, countries, um, the US-Japan relationship uh, under Trump uh, was, was fairly good. Um, and uh, it, there was a good piece, in fact, in The Hill by Jeffrey Hornung lately that looked at um, uh, public opinion. Uh, it's true that public opinion uh, surveys showed a modest decline in, uh, in uh, positive responses on the relationship, but still 80% of Japanese thought that US-Japan relations were good. 79% of them uh, had uh, positive feelings toward the United States. Uh, a lot of this I think was due to at the top, the unique relationship uh, that uh, Donald Trump had with Shinzo Abe. And of course now both of them uh, are out of office. But you know, as, as we used to say, you know, back in, in the times when um, we were more worried uh, about relations with Japan, you know, no news is good news. And you really had very little news coming out of the alliance over the past four years, even though ironically, of course, you had a, a great deal of, um, of change going on uh, in, in the region. So I think to begin with the fact that um, it's sort of the dog that didn't bark in the night, the fact that we haven't had any type of major blow up between Tokyo and Washington uh, for uh, you know, years stretching back even before Trump is overall an indicator of strength in the relationship. Now that said, of course, one of the, the big um, uh, negative moments in, in that uh, the last four years was the US pulling out of TPP, but Tokyo plowed ahead went ahead with its own version of the, uh, the revised TPP, the Comprehensive and uh, Strategic uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, certainly it's something that uh, the US should look into getting re-involved with. Um, but even that again, wasn't, wasn't uh, a body blow to the, to the bilateral relationship because the two sides wound up negotiating uh, the, the understanding, the beginnings of a free trade agreement between the two. So, it was whether you want to see it as you know uh, two steps forward, one step back, or steps sideways. There was not really a great upheaval that the Biden administration had to now face in in coming into office. Um, let me talk about the positives uh, briefly, uh, where we are with the Biden administration, and then some of the the potential negatives. Uh, on the positives, um, you have early on, strong statements by the administration reaffirming everything that we've come to take for granted uh, in the relationship, or at least uh, in the past decade, let's say decade and a half. Uh, you had the president talking with Prime Minister Suga and reaffirming US support uh, for the Senkaku Islands, uh, Japan's administrative control of the Senkaku Islands. You had um, Defense Secretary Austin say the same thing in his uh, discussion with the Japanese defense minister. You also had the Quad, which was revitalized during the last days uh, of the Trump administration, uh, mentioned explicitly by uh, Defense Secretary Austin as something that the US would continue. All strong indications that in many ways it was going to be, uh, or it's going to be business as usual. I, I would say you would pair that with uh, the statements by the administration stating that they would in many cases keep uh, up the, the Trump policy towards China, that there won't be significant changes in that, there will be changes in tenor, 
there will be changes in rhetoric, there may be certain changes in emphasis, but on the whole uh, that they've indicated, if you listen to what Secretary Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken has said and others, that there's going to be a, a, lot, of, a lot of continuity. Now, let's wait and see if that's actually what happens. Um, there's other indications that they may take different uh, approaches towards Huawei, they may take different approaches uh, towards um, freedom of navigation operations, though they just uh, announced one and, and allowed one to, to go through just this week and then one their first week in office. But for the most part, it seems to be business, uh, business as usual. Um, areas where there could be greater concern on the part of Tokyo that there may be a divergence, and this is where um, I think Mike's comments were extremely interesting and extremely nuanced, but in terms of the short-term politics of it, um, Tokyo is obviously paying very close attention to uh, the rhetoric, as I mentioned, much of it positive. And yet hearing statements like strategic patience, which uh, Jen Psaki stated last week was going to be a cornerstone of dealing with China, uh, may lead Tokyo to question uh, the degree to which the administration will take potentially a more passive attitude towards China or a more wait and see attitude towards China. Um, certainly on North Korea, um, Japan's going to be watching very closely what uh, the Biden administration does. Now, I think it's fair, though it's not necessarily indicative, but it's fair to, uh, to state, of course, that almost everybody involved, in fact, I think everybody involved in the administration today, of course, was in the Obama administration in, in one position or another, many of them directly advising then Vice President Biden and now advising President Biden or having other positions in the administration. And there's no question that by the end of the Obama administration in 2009, Japan, uh, 2000, sorry, 2017, uh, Tokyo was worried about the state of the US commitment to uh, maintaining US presence uh, in the region to dealing not only with North Korea, but to dealing with China, concerns over lack of activity in the South China Sea, concerns over uh, the growth of Chinese statements or Chinese uh, ability to interfere in uh, both free societies through um, organizations like Confucius Institutes and the like. Um, so the, the track record that the Obama administration brings into office from, uh, you know, into the new Biden administration is at least something that people are going to be watching. That's why I said the welcome comments that have been uh, stated over the past couple of weeks, uh, the indication that there's at least a good chance that a lot of the policies that recognized a competition with China will not be going away. It's all going to be in the execution. It's all going to be uh, in the emphasis. The last thing I'll say, because I know we all want to get to um, conversation for the rest of the period, but the last thing I'll say is that there's two sides to this relationship, of course. And so as much as we may focus on what the Biden administration is going to do, there's also questions of what the Suga administration is going to do. Uh, now, given uh, Prime Minister Suga's position as the key right-hand man to Prime Minister Abe through his tenure. Again, we, it, we interpret that as there's going to be a lot of um, continuity. And certainly in the States, we've, we've looked for continuity. Um, that said, uh, the, the uh, Suga administration uh, has gone in a slightly different route than the US has wanted, uh, or Japan is going in a slightly different route than the US has wanted on Huawei. Uh, not excluding it from systems, though reserving the right to exclude it from systems. Um, on uh, the decoupling, Mike, it was I forget if it was Mike or, um, or Yoshi who was talking about the decoupling. Uh, and in fact, there actually was a, a decoupling move on the part of the, of the Abe administration, which was to set aside over $2 billion and, and disperse, I think at least something like half a billion dollars in helping close to 90 Japanese firms relocate their operations off the mainland and either bring them back to Japan or open up uh, factories and uh, presences in other parts of Asia, primarily Southeast Asia. Um, so will, will the Suga administration continue that? Uh, what will be its position on, for example, letting China into uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which Beijing has indicated its interest in joining? Um, where will Tokyo be on countering the influence, influence operations of uh, the CCP and of China in the way that the uh, Trump administration was very forthright in doing in labeling, for example, CCTV as 
uh, a, a foreign registered agent of, of, um, uh, of the Communist Party and of the government. So there are clearly areas where we have to wait for both new administrations to make clear what their policies are going to be. And certainly on the part of, uh, of the Biden administration, but it would be helpful as well on the part of the, um, of the Suga administration are the top level strategic statements. That's, that's in some way what a lot of us are waiting for. What will be the strategic documents that guide them going forward? How do they interpret the state of the, the competition with China? What areas of cooperation there are? Whether it will be uh, alliance interests first or an attempt uh, to find a modus vivendi with Beijing. So that said, I think we should be cautiously optimistic uh, because of the continuity we see on both sides, but recognize um, that there is always going to be uh, increasing differential as you go down the line uh, with both of these administrations. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. Thank you very much. Uh, I was struck of your, one of your closing comments there about cautious optimism, uh, because I was trying to ascertain whether there's a fault line between you and Mike and Yoshi uh, on, on the optimism, pessimism spectrum. Uh, but maybe uh, as a way to get into that, if you'd like to, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just invite Mike and Yoshi, uh, well, all three of you, if you have any comments to make in response to uh, the, the remarks that the others have made. Well, um, you know, in, in terms of uh, uh, Japan ROK uh, uh, relations and also uh, about uh, North Korea, uh, you know, first in terms of uh, Japan ROK uh, relations, you know, I, I would just really underscore uh, uh, Yoshi's point that this has really been a problematic piece in uh, Japan's foreign policy. I mean, there's much that I admire about uh, Prime Minister Abe's foreign policy, but if there is just one uh, gaping hole, uh, it's uh, how bad uh, uh, Japan-South Korea relations uh, have uh, gotten under his uh, uh, watch. And, uh, and of course, uh, there is responsibility uh, on the South Korean uh, uh, side uh, but, but for me, uh, you know, when Japan talks about a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, not to have uh, a central place uh, for South Korea, which is one of the most dynamic economies and dynamic democracies in the world, not to be part of FOIA uh, is, is, a, is really problematic uh, for the Japanese uh, vision. And then uh, on North Korea, um, you know, like everyone, you know, I wish North Korea would uh, abandon this nuclear program. Uh, but uh, being a realist, I think the, the chances of that happening anytime soon are are close to nil. And so uh, one of the key things uh, will be uh, to try to put a freeze uh, to stop uh, this uh, program, which means to some extent recognizing uh, where North Korea is uh, today. Uh, and to try to uh, promote some kind of, of uh, peace uh, uh, regime uh, along the Korean uh, uh, peninsula. But this means that Japan uh, uh, has to be willing uh, to kind of accept such an interim agreement. Uh, and you know, I think in the past, um, you know, Japan has had difficulty um, uh, pursuing a very effective policy towards North Korea. Uh, because for very understandable reasons, uh, the abduction uh, issue. Uh, but, but I think you know, now has come the time where uh, Japan uh, has to be uh, very realistic and uh, collaborate with the United States uh, and South Korea uh, on a realistic policy of uh, engagement with North Korea. Thank you, Mike. Yoshi, do you have any comments? Well, uh... Maybe about uh, the decoupling, which uh, uh, Misha uh, mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> I think what U.S. or, or Trump, uh, in fact, tried to do uh, was to protect, uh, you know, some American interests from, you know, penetration of Chinese, you know, kind of influence, and uh, and. China has been doing the same thing for years. It's creating its own kind of, you know, AI world, for instance, excluding, you know, Google and so forth. And so China has been decoupling itself, you know, in a way. And if both US and China moves along this line, uh, 
you know, its its impact upon the region should be should be huge, and uh, and uh, Abe's attempt and uh, and maybe maybe this has been a trend, uh, particularly since uh, Chinese uh, th you know threatening. Uh, way of using its export uh, to Japan in retaliation. I mean, mm. uh, it's 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 not a systemic decoupling, but I think virtually attempts to lessen dependence upon China, and uh, uh, this has been a trend I think for years, and uh, which will continue. And uh, but uh, but uh, issue real issue is how far you know we can do that, and uh, I think this. Uh, there is some division in opinions between Japanese businesses and uh, some strategic thinkers, perhaps. And uh, so, so that's 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 my short comment to this uh, decoupling dimension. And as to Japan, South Korea, we need the whole another session <laughs> to to discuss whole kinds of issues. So, so I, will, I, I will stay away for, uh, for now. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I had just a couple of questions before we, uh, we turn to the ones from the audience. Uh, uh, I just want to return briefly to this issue of primacy that uh, all of you addressed in varying degrees. Uh, and the fact that um, there seems to be a general perception that it's been eroding US primacy in the region. And Yoshi referred to the restructuring of Asia in a sense that uh, doesn't have China supplanting the United States, but certainly moving closer to the center. Uh, and the question I have is what are the implications of that for the definition of U.S. interests as perceived uh, certainly by Japan, but uh, it seems that in, informally at least retaining U.S. primacy in the region has long been uh, defined or at least implied as a U.S. vital interest in the region. If that's no longer sustainable or vital and is leading to a recalibration of Washington's definition of its interest in the region, what are the implications of that potentially for Japan? To anyone? Well, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as I, as I stated, um, if, uh, you know, for the, if the United States had the will uh, uh, to restore its primacy, and here I'm basically re referring to its military primacy, to be the predominant military power uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, I think Japan would prefer that. Uh, but the problem is, is that uh, that may be a very difficult uh, and perhaps unattainable uh, goal. And if it really requires uh, uh, an intensification of U.S.-China uh, rivalry, or that uh, Japan really has to step up and uh, help the United States uh, actively restore that primacy, then I'm not sure uh, Japan uh, uh, has the will uh, uh, to do that uh, uh, and, and may not have uh, the capability. And so um, I think both the United States and Japan probably have to uh, kind of think more realistically. And, and I think a more realistic option is to achieve some kind of balance of power so that China is deterred and constrained uh, from uh, uh, being uh, kind of aggressive. Uh, in, in the region, uh, so that you know it doesn't uh, launch a war uh, against uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, and so even though we may not have primacy, we may be able to achieve some kind of uh, balance of military power uh, that would sustain uh, deterrence. Any other thoughts on that from uh, Misha or Yoshi? If I may briefly, uh... certainly. Well, I'm not in the position to talk about American interests, but uh, uh, I think U.S. is suffering from sort of uh, dichotomous, you know, uh, pull and push between engagement and uh, sort of uh, uh, retreatment, and uh, and th this will con continue to bother uh, American decision makers. Uh, but uh, so we have uh, the countries in the region uh, should be uh, should appreciate uh, that that sort of difficulty associated with the U.S. And so helping the U.S. I think virtually should mean that 
uh, we will work on this sort of, you know, uh, dialectical sort of, you know, uh, internal uh, dynamism of the United States. And uh, so, so our efforts should be to, of course, to continue to encourage America to engage in the region. And uh, this should be for our benefit as well as for the United States. And, uh, and here the difficult question uh, is the kind of dynamism of uh, our region being restructured with China coming at the center of the process uh, in, in many ways. Uh, I think this is inevitable. And so to what extent we would accept that and uh, would look at this, uh, you know, kind of China center dynamism, an integral part of the sort of uh, regional prosperity and security. And uh, this is a hard question, of course. And, uh, and so, so one thing which we don't want to see, and uh, this would be detrimental to American interests as well, is the, the clash you know, fundamental, an uh, ultimate clash between China and the United States. And uh, there, there will be no, no winner out of this. So, so, so to, to avoid this, I think regional countries should play a greater role. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, this is a very delicate sort of balancing act of a sort. And in order for us to do this, I think, uh, as I said in my initial talk, uh, uh, intervention. Uh, there is a dynamism of Asian countries, Asia, Indo-Pacific countries, who are getting together, and uh, and so how U.S. would look at this process, and how U.S. would associate it with this process of, you know, kind of Indo-Pacific nations, you know, getting closer, and this this should be. Is this should be a kind of new sort of uh, area where we have to think uh, very deeply and with a long-term view and uh, whether or not the U.S. would see interest in this development, uh, I think uh, is going to be one of the keys which would affect the new, new kind of international uh, regional development uh, in the name of Indo-Pacific uh, Corporation. Well, I just, you know, very briefly say on the, you know, the, we got a lot of questions. So uh, I just briefly say on the, um, the primacy issue, um, you know, it, it you know, the, the, the idea is one for sort of the seminar room, right? I mean, it, 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 what happens on the ground, on the waters and the skies every day is what matters uh, when we're talking about security. Um, we've seen the destruction of Hong Kong's freedom and uh, civil society over the past year and the world did nothing about it. Uh, we've seen slave labor camps and genocide against the Uyghurs uh, for years and the world has done nothing about it. Um, we have seen the world do nothing about, um, uh, you know, this is not an aggressive act, but uh, done nothing to offer an alternative to basically a Chinese driven uh, 5G global environment. Um, so the, the, the primacy question is one that I, I think you just you have to disaggregate and, and, and look at all of the different ways in which national interests of various actors, uh, sometimes shared, often not, are, are uh, you know, impacted by all of these different things uh, happening. And, um, you know, what happened in Hong Kong has already raised immediately concerns over Taiwan, what happens with uh, the, the debate over Taiwan raises concerns in Japan over, uh, you know, uh, freedom of navigation, freedom of the high seas and the like. But I would say there are, there are these other areas as well. You know, if the Biden administration um, doesn't uh, attempt to come up with some sort of uh, alternative to Huawei's 5G, um, you know, then, then that's just going to be a continuation of previous American failures to do so. Uh, and it's going to be seen as a, a major um, you know, uh, majorly detrimental to the, the idea of the United States as uh, a leading economic power. Same thing with chip making. If we see over this decade, the 2020s, a significant shift towards China in the, uh, in the chip making industry, then that's going to be seen uh, as a major, a major shift. Same thing with, with uh, you know, alternative currencies and fintech. Um, so I just think that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of lump it into one area when um, the the um, the demands uh, on policymakers from what the U.S. has not already done are continually increasing. 
Thank you very much, Misha. The, uh, as has been noted, we have lots of questions uh, to starting to rack up here. So I'm going to defer any uh, of my own and head straight into those uh, in no particular order here. But uh, the, one of the first questions we had uh, is kind of a interesting uh, tangent here. Uh, Jeffrey Otto asks, uh, well, cites George Friedman from Stratfor as having suggested that Japan's internal stability uh, is in some sense a strategic risk to the alliance. Uh, maybe not in the short term, but probably over the long term. Do, do any of you uh, agree with that assessment or have comments to make on that? Does, does that mean lack of internal stability is, is a problem or the fact that there is well, I, internal I think the stability is a problem? Uh, hmm? Well, I mean, we already have, a, you know, the Suga administration is, is struggling a bit, I guess. Uh, and I, I, the implication, I suppose, might be uh, that kind of instability of leadership. Uh, not, hmm. Well, not, not instability of, of less stable or long-term leadership as we saw under Abe, for example. Yeah, I didn't, maybe Jeffrey can send in the clarification. I didn't see the, the Friedman piece. I could see it interpreted as saying because Japan's so internally stable, it is risk averse, it's inward looking and therefore it's not. Uh, and this is a little bit what Mike was saying. It's not going to be willing to go too far out on the limb uh, in terms of uh, helping maintain stability in the region. Although I, I don't, you know, I think that when you look at Japan of today versus, you know, the Japan of, of 20 years ago, uh, let alone longer, it, it's far more engaged with the region and it's far more partners. I think we've had some quad questions, which um, are, are interesting. I think the quad should be a, a, a top priority of the Biden administration. Uh, it should have been priorities all the way through for all administrations. It's just, you know, time, uh, they weren't ready for it back when Abe first proposed it back in what, 2007, and a, de a decade makes a big difference. So um, that should be a, 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 a big um, role, I think, for um, getting Japan involved multilaterally so it doesn't feel perhaps in response to some of what Mike's saying that it's just a bilateral thing and it's the old, I forget what the political scientists call it, you mm -hmm. know, entrapment and um, uh, whatever, dis abandonment, I think that's what they called it. Actually, I was going to raise the question that you uh, just mentioned about the quad, because that was one of the questions. And I would link it. There was another question we had about uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific framework. Uh, I think those kind of operate in tandem, at least the concepts do. And Mike mentioned uh, uh, the FOIP. Uh, well, what, how do all of you assess? I mean, you, Misha, you, you mentioned the how important it should be, but how do you each assess the prospects? Uh, there seems to have been some divergence of uh, priorities, uh, internal competence within the, the members of the quad, questions about whether it should expand. Mike mentioned the South Koreans, uh, and perhaps uncertainty among the members of the quad of what the free and open Indo-Pacific concept was supposed to, or does mean, and, when, and how it will evolve uh, under the Biden administration. So I invite each of you to comment on uh, whether the quad, whether the FOIP uh, under the Biden administration. Uh, well, um, uh, um, you know, I guess uh, we should probably accentuate uh, some of our differences uh, since we seem to uh, agree on so many things. Uh, but uh, I tend to be uh, more skeptical about the Quad. I mean, first, you know, the Quad was known as the Quadrilateral Security uh, Dialogue. And to think that the Quad would somehow evolve into a, uh, a hard NATO-like uh, collective uh, defense kind of organization, I, I think is just unrealistic. Un and one of the interesting things is that the, at the recent Quad meeting, um, uh, the Australians, the Indians, and the Japanese had a very different take uh, on the Quad uh, from that of the United States. Uh, and uh, they emphasized the importance of ASEAN uh, centrality. It's a much uh, softer kind of uh, conception. And it certainly is one that, uh, while balancing against uh, China, also uh, wants to engage uh, uh, China. So, um, you know, I, I can understand uh, why in the United States there is this feeling that the Quad could turn into some kind of uh, hardcore security alliance, uh, but I just think that uh, that's uh, unrealistic. Uh, and the free and open Indo-Pacific, I think, is a nice organizing uh, concept, 
Uh, but when we get down to the, the nitty gritty of the details and concrete policy, you know, such as uh, Myanmar, uh, then, you know, there's uh, all sorts of questions. You know, what is uh, what is the free and open about this Indo uh, uh, Pacific? So I'm um, much mm -hmm. more on the uh, skeptical side. Well, if I could jump in quickly. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just with Mike, I look, I, I, yeah, I agree that I don't think the Quad's going to become a hard alliance, but to increase uh, multilateral cooperation among uh, the three, you know, three of the leading with the United States, three of the leading liberal nations in Asia, I think is important. Also three extremely militarily capable uh, nations that already do quite a bit in terms of maritime security, maritime domain awareness, uh, transnational issues. I think that's all to be encouraged and we should be doing more. Are we going to get to a formal alliance of, you know, we have alliances obviously with Japan and, and Australia, not with India. Are we going to get to a formal quad alliance? Probably not, but I don't think we need we need to be there. And and as for the, it's a, so, Paul, it's such a terrible foip. It's just horrible. We got to, you know, the, the, the phrase is good, but just to say it is horrible. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I'm, I'll go on the record. I think it's outstanding. Why? Because it goes back to what the U.S. has been doing in the Pacific since the 19th century. Um, our very first engagements with the Pacific, when we sent Caleb Cushing to China in 1844, were to ensure, because we were a weak nation back then, was to ensure that all nations had access into Asia that they could trade. I mean, we didn't call it that, we didn't call it Asia back then, but, um, and we've carried that through. I mean, we carried it through uh, into the open door notes and we carried it through certainly into post 1945. Um, and I think it's, and I think it is about, I don't, do we even use this term anymore? The global commons. It was so, so we used to use it all the time, you know, 15 years ago, but we're all old. So maybe they use something else now. But it's, it's the, you know, the free and open is about the global commons. It's that um, no one will be denied access to it. And then you can expand the concept from the very un easily understandable maritime element to the aerial element, to the cyber element, uh, now into the, you know, the digital elements beyond that. So I, I think that it, it's something that we should actually be proud of, quite frankly, as an outside nation, we've had a very consistent strategy or, or we've had a very consistent national goal for well over a hundred years now, edging on 200 years. Uh, and what we've always been trying to do is figure out the appropriate strategies to carry it out. And that's where we are today. Uh, I think it was, you know, if it was uh, Dr. Kissinger said, we're in the foothills of a, of a US China Cold War, I, I may be paraphrasing him, I don't know if it's the foothills of a Cold War, but what we clearly are in the foothills of a reassessment of the US-China relationship. And what that will necessitate is a new strategy going forward. So um, we're, we're in the beginning of that, not at the end of it. Oh, uh, you, if I may. Yeah. Of course. I'm a, I'm a middle of the road uh, uh, by nature. So I mean, between Mike and Misha. <laughs> uh, 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 on, on this Indo-Pacific. But before that, let me speak a little bit about uh, the, the internal uh, uh, a question about Japanese domestic stability or instability. Uh, well, the Prime Minister Suga's popularity opinion polls uh, keeps declining, and um, uh, which uh, could cause you know, some, some res reshuffling of the leadership. Uh, in the near future, I don't know, but uh, uh, there will be uh, elections, uh, you know, uh, by by the by fall uh, this year, and um, so th there will be some critical internal political development for sure, and so which would mean Prime Minister Suga is mostly preoccupied with uh, domestic, you know, handling of domestic uh, politics, and uh, uh, he, when he started, he. He, he said that he would follow the footsteps of Prime Minister Abe in, in diplomacy. And the flip side of that statement is that uh, he does not necessarily have clear uh, idea as to, you know, Japanese sort of external, external policies. And uh, uh, there will be both the good and the uh, bad sides of this uh, from American perspective. And the uh, good, good side could be that uh, uh, the, 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 he will continue to say, and he has been saying this, 
that the alliance with the United States is the basis of Japanese, you know, the, the strategy or external policies. And uh, so in a way, America can take it for granted that Japan would continue to get along with, with the United States. And, uh, but the somewhat negative side of this, particularly under the Biden administration, uh, could be that Biden is saying that he's, he's going to work with allies to sort of, you know, restructure its uh, regional strategy and global strategies. And uh, so this, this would give a good uh, and a very important sort of task, uh, you know, for Japan to be, have to begin to think, you know, really strategically and, 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 and regionally and globally. Uh, but uh, this part uh, could, could, be, could be lacking. I mean, in, in, in the future uh, as, as an uh, initiative coming from, from the Suga administration. And uh, so, so I'll stop here as to this. And the Indo-Pacific, uh, one, one of the questions was uh, about the uh, US-Japan alliance being the core of this. Uh, how, how would it, how, you know, uh, what does it mean? And again, uh, there are both, uh, you know, a positive and negative sides of, of this. And uh, of course, without the United States, uh, this structure will not be that much effective, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this, you know, China-centered process in the region. And uh, but uh, the, the the downside of this is if the U.S.-Japan alliance element is emphasized too much, many of other you know, partners in the region uh, will sort of will retreat from, you know, strongly associating themselves with with this with this process, and uh, and uh, the, the, about FOIP uh, in in the second sort of uh, foreign minister FOIP meeting, uh, which happened in Tokyo uh, last October, you know, uh, there was some difference between Australian release press relief release coming from foreign minister and the Japanese uh, press release. And Japanese press release emphasized, of course, free and open, you know, uh, and FOIP. But the Australian statement did not mention this free and open. They dropped this, this phrase from, from their statement, just simply in the Pacific. And uh, I mean, this, of course, the, the, the core question has to do with, you know, how hard line you should take I mean, against, against this China factor. And uh, so, so China element could could is is all both a you know connecting factor as well as a sort of dividing factor uh, among among sort of Indo-Pacific you know uh, even even court nations uh, India India's you know approach toward China is is somewhat also similar to that of ASEAN and maybe Australia to some extent, and uh, so Quad is a, I think it's it's now a process. And uh, it's it's evolving, and uh, as Mike said, they are emphasizing the principle of ASEAN cent centricism, uh, ASEAN centrality, and uh, I think this is somewhat a compromise. I think uh, we all know that uh, ASEAN has played an important role in, in the past and is also playing some role uh, today, but there are limits to to the extent you know to, to which ASEAN way could could be effective in managing this, the rise of China. And we all know the limitations. And, but uh, given the limitations, I mean, uh, leaders are saying, we will abide by ASEAN centrality. So in a way, this would mean that uh, they really do not have, you know, very clear consensus as to, you know, where, where, where we, are, we are moving. And uh, what sort of form formality this this you know quad and or you know in the Pacific strategy would take, and uh, so the role of the United States I think could be both sort of uniting factor as well as dividing factor. And again, this is a kind of another sort of uh, aspect of dilemma uh, I think that we are facing. But but this is a process, and uh, positive things are also happening as uh, Misha said. I mean the virtual cooperation even including militaries, you know, among, among these countries. Uh, but uh, there, there are also uh, differences. Yeah, thank you for that. Actually, that, uh, that kind of transitions to, there are several questions we've received here, which uh, um, get into this broader issue of US uh, and Japan, Japanese coordination of policy within the region broadly, but with, particularly with regard to China. 
And one of them is a segue from the points, some of the points that were just made about the, the quad and the, and the free and open in the Pacific. Just a quick question, uh, a follow-up from that from Evan Sankey at the center. Uh, are there any concerns in Japan that the free and open in the Pacific or the quad initiative uh, have themselves contributed to a worsening, contributed to the worsening of relations between the United States and China? Or was that an anticipated side effect? Well, uh, maybe, maybe I should respond. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, uh, that could be true, but uh, uh, I don't know whether that's relevant uh, uh, specifically uh, relating to, to uh, you know, FOIP or QUAD. Uh, the, the dilemma for Japan is uh, whatever initiatives that Japan would take uh, in, in regional policies, uh, China would certainly take it as sort of somewhat anti-China or, or you know, uh, countering uh, Chinese uh, kind of behaviors. And uh, this, this is un un unavoidable. And uh, so position of Japan should be to, con to, be, to be persistent in, you know, uh, impressing, uh, if possible, the Chinese, some Chinese, but if not, uh, at least other countries, that uh, this, 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 you know, regional engagement policy, including, you know, Quad or, or FOIP. Uh, uh, China element is there, of course, everybody knows this, but the, the purpose is not necessary to sort of, you know, push back China. I mean, uh, we cannot do that. And, uh, and, and in a way, it's, it's an effort by ourselves to create our sort of networks and jointly think about sort of, uh, you know, the future of the region at the time of the rise of China. And uh, these efforts to, you know, talk and co collaborate among ourselves, uh, you know, have been terribly lacking in, in the past history of our, our region. And, uh, so American presence is very, of course, important. This, the, this could be the key in one way. But on top of this, you know, the, there, there should be efforts on our part to think about our region by ourselves. And, uh, and these efforts are not uh, almost by definition, not anti-China. I mean, because we have to live with China. We cannot move away from the region. So, so, so long-term eventual goal of ours is to to coexist with China, you know, peacefully and stably. But but in the process, there are concerns. Uh, that's that's how I think we are we are beginning to talk among ourselves. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I don't mean to overburden you, you <laughs> Yoshi. Uh, there's another question about broader U.S.-Japan coordination in the region uh, from T.J. Pimpel, uh, which gets at uh, an element of that. Uh, the Trump administration obviously withdrew from the TPP process, but the TJ's question is, uh, to what extent does the, the forward progress uh, in the absence of the United States uh, on CPTPP, uh, on RCEP, uh, and Japan's agreements with the EU, uh, to what extent do those handicap US economic interests in the region? And is there a way that the United States and Japan can get back on track to work collaborately to fix that? And Mike and Misha can certainly weigh in on this as well. Uh, well, uh, I, I, no, oh. uh, uh, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. yeah. I, I used to think that TPP-11 was a very important development in the sense that this was perhaps the first sort of uh, kind of, you know, uh, critical regional arrangements, uh, which uh, does not have both the US and China. I mean, so it's, it, it's a sort of, you know, uh, grouping among, among regional countries, you know, aside from US and China. And this is, a, a, you know, alongside with the, the kind of basic thinking that I've been, you know, uh, uh, having as an assumption of my points. I mean, the importance of, you know, regional countries getting together. And uh, so, so this as one, one dimension of this, but uh, this has become, is increasingly becoming a game between U US and China. Uh, I mean, triggered by Xi Jinping's kind of expression of interest in, joining and thinking about joining this, this framework. And the US would have to respond, of course. And uh, so in this dimension, I think uh, US should seriously think about 
you know, rejoining or joining, you know, this, this, this framework. Uh, but uh, this would require some, you know, another round of uh, kind of long talks and uh, which would be, which would be difficult, would not be easy for some members of existing TPP-11. So it's, it's not uh, as simple as that, but uh, so it's, again, the point is, uh, this has become kind of another area where uh, US-China strategic rivalry would mean a lot. Mike, were you gonna comment on that? Uh, well, well I, uh, you know, I think, you know, simply, yes, uh, the US will be a uh, handicap, especially in terms of uh, uh, being hurt by the, uh, the reduction of tariffs that come uh, uh, in, in the context of both the TPP-11 uh, and uh, RCEP. And, and I'm not sure that uh, something bilateral between the United States and Japan uh, could uh, uh, basically compensate that because a lot has to do with uh, third party uh, uh, competition. So uh, at, at the end, you know, I think if uh, uh, the United States wants to overcome those uh, uh, handicaps, it's going to have to go back into these multilateral uh, processes. And, and I think one of the reasons why Japan has, has moved on, on all three fronts uh, in terms of multilateralism is to create very strong incentives. Uh, for the United States to come back in. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are two questions here that get uh, to another element of the regional and particularly Japanese perceptions of the US military power in the region. Uh, General Chip Gretson also with the council uh, had some thoughts on the, on the primacy issue in terms of US military primacy. Um, but he, he raises the issue of non-military cooperation within the alliance uh, on some of these uh, security issues. Would, would Chip asks, would some joint US-Japan research and industrial projects in the tech area, for example, energy be helpful to provide more common efforts for the alliance? And then Dov, Dov Zakheim asks, I think a related question, uh, noting uh, the impression left by Yoshi, and in fact, uh, all of you to a certain extent that the US is kind of losing its military superiority in the region. Uh, General Gregson has some comments on that, uh, but is there a perception that this is already lost, uh, and how, how do we compensate for that? Uh, and how, how do you evaluate, uh, I guess, in tandem with uh, General Gregson's suggestion for uh, non-military cooperation, uh, which might have military implications? Uh, how do we evaluate the Pentagon's reevaluation of its uh, emphasis and its approach on East Asian operations? Those are kind of two questions, but I think they're somewhat related. Well, I would just I would jump in just by saying, um, first, I, I think, um, you know, the stage we're at uh, is one I think shared on a bipartisan sense that um, the 40 year uh, policy that we had with China needed some significant revision. Um, the debate we're having is over well, what that means and how far it should go. I think the Trump administration, you know, made very clear it's not that they always um, fully articulated it or, or, or certainly executed it. Um, but I think if you look at the, the collection of, of documents that they put out, starting with the national security strategy, at the Indo-Pacific strategy, at DOD, the, um, the strategic approach to the PRC from the White House, they actually, uh, at the very last days, declassified uh, the, um, the, the internal strategy that they had. Um, if, you, if you take all of those together, uh, then I think you see uh, an approach that largely was driven by the concept of reciprocity, that you would want um, equal treatment and that you would you would approach things in a way that um, essentially you know to be honest left a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the the rhythm of the relationship in Beijing's hands meaning the in some ways the Trump administration was rather reactive and I think when they finally got to this point of openly acknowledging that they were adopting a policy of reciprocity, then that's literally, you know, what what that means is that you are responding, uh, but responding in kind to actions on the other side. Um, so I think that um, we should be reviewing all of what we're doing. But um, to Chip's point about uh, the non-military cooperation, I think that should be central. Um, you have to offer alternatives to countries. 
uh, whether it's to One Belt, One Road, uh, or uh, AIIB, or Huawei 5G, in order to maintain the type of open, and there is no question that there's a major difference between how China sees the digital world that it wants to create and the digital world that we want, which is far more open and is, and is not used for the type of, whether it's social credit or um, predatory activities that, that you have on the part uh, of, of the party state. Um, so we should be offering alternatives. We should be cooperating with Japan and Australia and India and Britain and everyone to be coming up with those alternatives. And we should be investing heavily in R&D the way that we did in the Cold War. There are um, bills that have gone through Congress on that, but we absolutely should be. If we lose our lead in chip making, if we lose, um, uh, if we lose the ability to shape a, a fintech uh, architecture, I hate that word, but we all use it, the architecture and environment, um, then of course we're simply giving uh, more and more space to China to become more influential and make it much harder for partners and potential partners to choose to be with us than it is to be with uh, the party that seems to have an answer to all of these questions, even if the answers that it gives are not always the ones uh, that people want to, to get. You see that division between us and Germany, between Britain and Germany, even between us and Japan on Huawei. So yeah, we need to be partnering on a lot of the softer things uh, because at the end of the day, that's what gives you national power. May I, may I follow? Uh, Please. I think uh, the the question about this you know, cooperation on non-military dimension, I, th I agree that it's, it's also very, very important. And uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance was not all about military cooperation. I think uh, there are economic dimension, you know, cultural and even value dimensions and the, it's not only the Pacific arrangement and it has global implications. And I think the same should be somewhat uh, replayed in the evolving sort of uh, quad process or FOIP process too. I mean, if one takes these mechanisms as uh, exclusively mi military, I think this could become a divisive source rather than the uniting uh, factor among Indo-Pacific countries. But if you extend this into non-military dimensions, and which are actually happening, you know, emphasizing infrastructure, quality infrastructure, you know, developments, cooperation among, among, you know, the Indo-Pacific nations and so forth. And uh, so um, more conscious kind of emphasis should be placed upon these other dimensions other than the military. I mean, then the co uh, perceptions as to quad or, you know, uh, FOIP or whatever uh, would, would begin to change and the process may begin to you know pick up and uh, so so this this has implications also uh, you mean uh, both as to so this relates to the question of the centrality of US Japan alliance and uh, if centrality of the US Japan alliance is is uh, is seen as critical in these non military dimensions i think overall uh, effect would be very positive uh, for 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 the process Thank you. Uh, we're running short on time here. I'm gonna lump together a few questions uh, that address in varying degrees uh, potential for US-Japanese cooperation and other regional issues. Uh, I'll just mention the three of these quickly and then invite any comments from any of you. Uh, one is a question from Bill Brooks, William Brooks, as to whether what, what uh, we see is the potential for Japan and the United States attempting to revive uh, any version of the six party process to, to deal with the, with the uh, with the uh, North Korea issue. Uh, second question uh, on another area is from Joe Bosco uh, with regard to Japan's commitment and willingness to support the United States in the defense of Taiwan. Uh, where are we on Japanese thinking on that? And then finally, uh, we mentioned Myanmar came up earlier. Uh, uh, and John Bradford asked the question uh, as to why I think he uh, interpreted uh, Yoshi's comments to suggestion that there'll be a dividing uh, factor uh, that Myanmar may be somewhat divisive in terms of how Washington and, and, uh, and Tokyo decide to deal with it. Uh, he, he observes that the United States and Japan sometimes or often take different approaches to authoritarian regimes uh, with regard to engagement with Iran and Cambodia, for example. Um, how, how, how is this going to be different or how will this be manifest in, in, uh, in any joint effort to uh, address the, the Myanmar issue? So we have North Korea, Myanmar, and Taiwan. Uh, where do they play into US-Japan cooperation in the region right now? 
Let me just mention briefly the Myanmar one because it's interesting. I think that some creative statecraft could actually um, meld the U.S. and, and Japan positions um, in terms of Japan. You know, Tokyo being more willing to engage uh, with um, uh, the regime now, the Tatmadaw, uh, and we've, we've seen that with others, um, and the U.S. Uh, putting pressure on what, what, what you would need would be good coordination between the two, and it'd be wonderful to see that where we actually have the end goal shared, and we're using uh, complementary, if different, means to get there. So I, I'd like to see us think uh, a, little bit, a little bit more creatively uh, about that. Uh, on Taiwan, um, I think this will be very important. Again, very encouraging statements from the Biden administration, from Secretary of State Blinken and others uh, on Taiwan, the invitation um, to um, Bi Xiao Kim to be, you know, at the, uh, um, uh, at the uh, inauguration. Uh, this is all very good. I think one of the most important um, initiatives that Trump undertook was to begin more normalization of our relations with Taiwan. Uh, Japan obviously does a lot that's quiet. Uh, and again, coordination between the two to basically figure out how you, you know, in essence, normalize uh, having Taiwan at the table would be extraordinarily important. And I think um, send, send an important message. Thank you, Misha. Mike or Yoshi, any other thoughts on? Okay. May I? Oh, 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 oh. okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, okay, well, okay. Uh, on, on, on Taiwan, <laughs> sorry, uh, on uh, Taiwan, uh, first, I think it's really important to uh, remember that Taiwan is, is perhaps uh, the most sensitive issue uh, in China-Japan uh, uh, relations for uh, all sorts of obvious uh, uh, historical uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and so, uh, you know, although over the years, Japan, I think, has uh, enhanced and deepened its relationship uh, with Taiwan uh, and the mutual perceptions between uh, Japan and Taiwan are extremely uh, uh, positive. Uh, there's been some uh, upgrading of diplomatic activity. There's been an enhancement of the economic relationship. But when it comes to security, uh, uh, this is uh, an area where there uh, should be a continuing prudence uh, on the part of Japan. And I think uh, uh, there will uh, uh, be. Uh, and uh, Japan, I think, will stick to its position of uh, strategic ambiguity uh, regarding uh, what it will do uh, during a Taiwan contingency. So th as a declaratory policy, it will stick to that. But uh, given the geographic location of Japan and how important uh, uh, U.S. military assets in Japan, especially in Okinawa, are to any imaginable Taiwan contingency. The more that Japan does to defend itself, it will have implications uh, for a Taiwan contingency. And I think uh, at the end, uh, you know, it will enhance uh, deterrence. But at the same time, uh, it's not just the issue of, of deterrence, uh, but the importance of reassurance. Uh, so you have to create an international context that so that the incentives or the motivation on the part of China to actually use military force to, uh, against Taiwan uh, abates, because um, you know, you know, I, I know that uh, Japanese would often say that if there is a war uh, uh, over Taiwan and the United States gets involved, it will be the end of the alliance if if Japan uh, does not join with the United States and Taiwan. You know, that's of course true. But one also has to look at the devastating consequence of such a war, and therefore it's in Japan's keen interest to work with the United States uh, to prevent such a war from happening in the first place. Well, uh, for, first as to Myanmar, yeah, yes, I agree. I don't think this is gonna uh, develop into a kind of conflict of issue between Tokyo and Washington at the administration level, uh, perhaps. And, uh, but uh, in terms of media reactions and some public opinions, uh, there, there could be some hiccups. Uh, but, uh, and uh, one dominant argument here in Japan uh, in, as to the recent uh, development in Myanmar is if 
Japan sort of antagonize uh, the current regime or the uh, military regime, uh, this will give uh, space for China to come in. I mean, that, uh, that kind of statement is, is, seems to be uh, impressing, you know, uh, many, including not non-informed uh, public in Japan. And uh, as to North Korea or six party talks, uh, I, have, I have always thought uh, that uh, if, uh, you know, Northeast Asian nations cannot cooperate on the issue of uh, North Korea nuclear, you know, program. There will be no other issue uh, which would make multilateral cooperation, you know, happen in, in, in this part of the world. But Biden administration will, will be tempted to move in this direction, but, but how far it can and will go, uh, I would like to see. And as to Taiwan, uh, I, I'm worried a little bit uh, that increasingly Chinese leadership has this project of, you know, so-called liberating Taiwan as, you know, uh, possible sort of agenda. Uh, I don't know how 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 long-term view they have, but this this view seems to be getting shorter uh, than before, and uh, uh, there is a discourse. Uh, I haven't seen anybody proving this, so it's just a discourse, a background sort of, you know, a point uh, that is the reason, one of the f important reasons why Xi Jinping abolished the tenure for the president, presidency was he wanted to achieve this, you know, in, in his lifetime. Uh, I don't know whether this is true or not, uh, but uh, so, so I think uh, ta Taiwan issue has become uh, one of, one of the central uh, you know issues in the chinese thinking of its future sort of regional you know uh, strategy and if that is the case uh, i think yeah the, the taiwan to think about taiwan issue is increasingly becoming important and as to japanese reaction well uh, how japan's so called value based diplomacy got started and this was about Taiwan, uh, as I as I sort of uh, did did some study, you know, in the mid 1990s, you know, Chinese uh, threatened, you know, Taiwan moving into democracy, and um, in a particular leader who is, you know, being elected uh, as national kind of uh, as a result of national elections, and uh, and so Taiwan becoming democratized. And the uh, democratization of Taiwan uh, moved on side by side with the phenomena of Taiwanization of many things. And uh, so uh, Beijing took it as sort of move, moving toward independence. And this was exactly at the time that many Japanese politicians, including uh, traditional conservative politicians, began to talk about values, democracy, and so forth. And uh, so in, in essence, this meant pro-Taipei, anti-Beijing in expression of uh, J Japanese reactions. And I think this permeated into the general public society. So Taiwan contingency is out of control of Japan, of course. But if you know uh, things really happen, I think uh, Japan would certainly associate itself with Taiwan and the, the United States, I would think, in terms of public opinion and the general reaction. And But when it comes to Japanese concrete behaviors, I think militarily, you know, we cannot do much. Expect expect to provide so-called logistical support uh, as being you know promised between the two governments uh, so far. And one big question mark uh, is whether or not Japan would invoke a sort of you know partial exercise of the right of collective self-defense. And in order for Japan, or to be precise, in order for Japanese prime minister to order the deployment of Japanese self-defense forces in contingencies. Uh, beyond the domain of Japan's, you know, national defense in the strict sense of the term. Government has to define uh, a particular contingency as an existential crisis. So, so if, if Japan defines Taiwan contingency as existential crisis for Japan, theoretically and legally, now Japanese prime minister can order deployment of self-defense forces. I mean, that's what uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, did uh, in, in 2015. But realistically, uh, how, whether or not Japan can actually do this, uh, it's another issue. You know, so our self-defense forces are not 
are being equipped with such weapons and they are not being trained in, in you know expecting such a scenario there are no indications that uh, you know uh, militarily uh, we are moving in that direction so there is still a gap between uh, aspiration expressed by prime minister abe and the continuation of post war sort of you know uh, practices of Japanese politics and uh, and uh, military, uh, you know, uh, strategy, and uh, so yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those were all very uh, very meaty answers. Uh, we have run beyond our anticipated time. Uh, there are several questions that we weren't able to get to, uh, but since we promised not to drag uh, this out too long for the benefit of our panelists, I think that. Uh, I think I'll, what I'll do is just invite each of you to, if you have any closing comments to make, uh, perhaps even if you want to address one of the questions we didn't get to briefly, uh, but just to wrap it up with a, a minute or so from each of you, if you have anything else you'd like to add. Uh, uh, well, I like to comment about uh, Japan ROK uh, relations. And I know uh, Ellen Song had asked this question about uh, whether the United States should uh, get involved. And, and I believe the United States should uh, get involved. Uh, and uh, it should get involved from both a short-term and a long-term perspective. On the, sh on the short term, uh, the United States uh, could help with institutional development. So we've talked a lot about the Quad, uh, but uh, you know, I think the United States really needs to, uh, to be much more vigorous in uh, uh, creating the institutional foundation of Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, United States cooperation. And one thing that I've been proposing for quite some time is that uh, you know, we have a, a two plus two dialogue between the United States and Japan. Uh, we have one between the United States and the ROK. Now, why not create a trilateral two plus two involving the foreign minister and the defense minister of all three countries or their equivalent? Uh, uh, every year, uh, you know, just so that, uh, you know, you, you meet and you, you keep uh, 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 things uh, kind of uh, positive in terms of this trilateral uh, relationship. And then, and then I think the United States on the short term uh, should not just focus on discrete issues like gsomnia or other uh, modalities of, of security cooperation, but really emphasize this vision about how important trilateral cooperation is for the stability uh, and future peace of the entire uh, region for all sorts of the value, value reasons. The sorts of things that we talk about when we talk about the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, the United States should really encourage Tokyo and, and uh, so uh, to see how important this relationship uh, uh, is. And then also in the short term, I think there are things that uh, the United States could constructively uh, support. Uh, there's some very good ideas about uh, government private sector cooperation to deal with some of the latest issues uh, regarding uh, the, the labor issue or the comfort women uh, issue. And so I think the United States should really kind of endorse uh, those kinds of, uh, of initiatives. And then in terms of the long term, I, I think the United States uh, uh, could work, you know, through various foundations, uh, along with uh, counterparts in Japan and and uh, South Korea, to establish the institutions for kind of continuous study, research, and dialogue about uh, historical uh, issues. Um, you know, I mean, the the stakes are very very high uh, in this, uh, but the amount of investment in this process. I think, unfortunately, uh, has been uh, very, very uh, low. So, so that's what I would uh, suggest, uh, that I think the United States should, can play a constructive role and should uh, play a constructive role. Thank can you, I follow up just briefly you know, on Japan, South Korea, as my final intervention? I think one thing which both Seoul and Tokyo should agree on is uh, as to the so-called two-track, you know, uh, process to track system uh, which is separating you know cooperation on real strategic issues and other issues and the history issue and uh, Moon Jae-in government has been talking about this but their hearts are not really into it mm -hmm. uh, that's my impression and 
Japanese uh, Tokyo side uh, is, is mixing them up, you know, the history question and the actual, you know, practical cooperation. So both sides are not really, you know, moving on this, mm -hmm. on the basis of this two track. And I think uh, establishing this two track system is critically important for the United States as well. And uh, the, so the, what the US can and should do is to get seriously involved in the first track of practical cooperation and the real strategic meaningful cooperation. But as to the history dimension, I think there, I, frankly, I don't think US has any, any role. I mean, uh, Japanese uh, temptation is for the US to be on our side and the same is true for Korea. And, uh, and this is a bilateral issue. I mean, Japan and South Korea should solve this. But, but uh, I think basis of this should be to separate you know, uh, make separation between these trucks. And then US would think about how to get involved in this practical, practical, you know, talks. Uh, that, that's, my, that's my take, yeah. Thank you very much. Those are very useful interventions. Misha, did you have any final comments? No, I think I've said my piece. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I mean, obviously we could continue this indefinitely, uh, which I think only highlights the importance of the opportunity we have to re-engage on Friday in the second round, uh, we're going to be having another session, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, addresses the uh, prospects for the alliance. And I think all of the issues we've addressed here today uh, are certainly fair game to be um, raised again uh, and see how much farther we can get in solving them all. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank Mike and Yoshi and Misha uh, for an extremely valuable and, and uh, sub substantive conversation. Uh, and uh, the rest of the viewing audience for their their attendance, their attention, and their questions. Uh, until then, we'll sign off until next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>